Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I've got a great guest with me here this week. I know I say that every week, but I really do mean it this time. <laughs> with me today is David Harsani. He's the author of a new book. David, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So your book, Euro Trash, Why America Must Reject the Failed Ideas of a Dying Continent, uh, is definitely with a controversial premise, but it's a really fascinating book. It's out now for folks. Uh, be sure to check out the links that will be in the description to order a copy. But just to start off, uh, why did you decide to write this book? Well, uh, I'm older than you by quite many years. Uh, when I was younger, there was always sort of a... Um, and maybe going before, before back all the way to early in the century, even you know the sophisticated people always praised Europe, especially in the cultural realm. Uh, even after two world wars and everything else that went on, uh, they always looked towards Europe. But lately, I noticed that our elites, you know, academics, Paul Krugman's columnists like that, and uh, constantly point towards Europe whenever we have something going you know, with our problems, you know, and, and looking for solutions there. And now obviously we do have plenty of problems to deal with. Um, but so I decided to take a deep dive, like topic by topic to debunk some of the things that were being said and, uh, and, and go beyond quantifiable things, but, you know, just cultural, our cultural personalities and why European ideas don't generally work here, at least modern European ideas. Well, and one of it, one of the things you start with is myths about America and how people view America in contrast to Europe. What is that perception that you sought to combat about America? Well, uh, mostly that they think that we're a bunch of you know uneducated, slack jawed yokels and religious fanatics, which is true, but not in in a bad way, right? In a good way, <laughs> we are. Meaning, you know, we have a lot of community here. It's very diffused. It's very local or was, um, it's not a centralized system. It's very hard for, the, one of the reasons, uh, you know, the Paul Krugmans or whoever, I keep mentioning him as a, as a straw man, but th they love Europe is that, you know, it's for technocrats, it makes sense. It's giant bureaucracies, top-down governance. Those things don't happen here. It seems it's messy and it seems like anarchy to a lot of people who want order. It is ordered, but it's... Uh, spontaneously ordered and uh, far more successful because of it. When you speak about, when you start talking <laughs> about spontaneous order, creative destruction, the libertarians everywhere are geeking out. But I, I definitely know kind of the starting premises that you're hoping to combat because I saw them all the time on the campus of like UMass Amherst, where almost everybody's left leaning, a progressive. You talk to them and many of them haven't actually spent time in Europe, but they come from the Bernie Sanders AOC School of Political Thought. They think of Europe as more enlightened, where, you know, they guarantee people the right human rights and they believe in diversity and tolerance and equity. And they don't have, you know, racists like Donald Trump in charge of their countries and all of this. So I guess I, maybe I just answered my own question, but what is the, the view of Europe that you think some Americans have that is, is wrong in the broadest sense? And then we'll get into some of the specific sub areas. Uh, well, I, in the most broad sense, that it's a tolerant place. We're more tolerant than we are. Um, obviously, we're a nation made up of human beings, so there are some bad ones, and we do some things that aren't right, and we say some things that aren't right. But as far as tolerance goes, there's no place on earth that has been more tolerant than the United States. It's a miracle of human history. Um, we have people from all over that would be killing each other in other situations, living in the same neighborhood, sending their kids to the same schools, um, becoming friends. Um and I, I hate to I hate to be like uh, what's his name Friedman over at the Times, but I was in a cab the other day, and uh, I met a guy here in the DC area. Who, he's Pakistani. He's married to an Indian woman. I mean, these are people who would kill each other in another situation, and in America they don't. So, um, sure, we say things sometimes that are wrong, but in in our conception of this country is that we're going to have a lot of different people. And we're going to live together. That we're diverse, but not. We're not strong because we're diverse. We're strong because we accept similar ideas uh, that bring us under the same roof that allow all of us to live our best lives if possible. And obviously, it's not always perfect. Obviously, it doesn't go, you know, people aren't perfect. But we're in quantifiable ways. If you believe polls, we are far more tolerant than Europeans in France or Germany or elsewhere. And in structural ways, we can get into that. We are clearly more tolerant and more successful here with our immigrants. 
Yeah, some people might be here, might be surprised to hear that places like Europe, uh, and we are generalizing, right? But yeah. we know what you mean, right? We're talking about the European Union, the countries we're most commonly compared to, France, England, Spain, uh, places like this. No they, one wants us to be like Albania. So yeah, I'm just, yeah, it's, it's like Western Europe. Right. Western yeah, yeah. Europe is, a, I think, a good a good framework to focus on. They actually are. Um, you cite a lot of interesting polling data in the book about how they actually have more experiences with racism and experiencing discrimination and offensive language and everything than in America. Yet the perception is backwards. Can you talk us through some of that data? Well, it's it's tough. T so the data is tough when people self you know, it's their perception of what racism is. So uh, an Amer someone might be more sensitive than someone else, things like that. Uh, but it's also important to remember that people in Europe don't have as many um, interactions with people who aren't like them as we do. We do it all every day, all the time. So all these things are important to take into context when you talk about this. But when Americans go over to Europe, quite often exchange students, for instance, they're always horrified, not always, but many of them are horrified by what they see in the real world in Europe. Now, you can go to a resort town and it's probably going to be great for you. You could go to a tourist attraction and it's probably going to be wonderful. But if you go into society there, there's deep racism in many places in Europe against uh, people from Africa. North, North Africans, you know, as well as, as others. And um, you see it, you know, I just, I mean, I d take a deeper dive into it, but you see it in quantifiable measure. I mean, in, you know, in just in, exper in experiences, which aren't, you know, which people have, but also in, in how uh, Europeans view the world. So if you ask Europeans, would you want to live next to someone who wasn't like you? Astonishingly high numbers of them say they would not. Um, in America, like 80% say they would, and even if they're lying, I think that says something good about our country is that the expectation is that you should be want to live next to someone who isn't like you. And um, and obviously in in the real world, we do it all the time, you know. So, um, you know, so I mean, I take a little deeper dive into that, but that's the general idea. Yeah, you refer to France in particular as the least tolerant people on the continent. Why is that? Oh, I have a bunch of polls in there about living amongst each other and what people how people view others who aren't like them, but also in, in hiring, in job hiring, even though others are pretty bad, too, like Sweden and elsewhere. Uh, Eastern European countries are, are, are really bad when it comes to uh, being open to other types of people. But to be, you know, which is weird, actually, because they don't have a lot of different types of people there. So you wonder why they're so, for instance, anti-Semitic in countries where there are almost no Jews. But in France, there's other problems as well. But that may be um, why. Right. Yeah. Don't you think exposure to people helps you understand them? I would think that. Yeah, I think that that's right. Um, but also, but that doesn't account for what's going on. Well, so in, in France, you have a lot of really sky high anti-Semitism right now and in Germany as well, uh, maybe the worst since the war. And the thing is, um, a lot of that comes from the immigrant population, which is antagonistic towards Jews for various reasons, but also, and some of it also from ethno-nationalistic blowback to, you know, immigration and everything that's going on. Um, and they're familiar with Jews for a long time, unfortunately for the for the Jews. But now, you know, they're having to experience really high levels of violence. So that's what I mean by polling. Like if someone made a Jewish joke here and I was offended, I would tell like uh, the Jewish group in a poll that I, you know, that there's anti-Semitism. But in France, you literally have murders and terroristic acts and physical violence where it, to the extent that France has to send soldiers out to separate people or guard Jewish institutions and that kind of anti-Semitism is, is, um, is really dangerous. Yeah, certainly. Um, but I do, you touched on immigration a little bit and I, I want to ask you about that in the broadest of strokes, cause you dive into it, into the book. Um, but why is it, or, or what is, what is the proof or, or reason that you believe the U S is better at assimilating immigrants than most of these European countries that are actually, they're held up as these bastions of tolerance and acceptance, but you say we're better at accepting immigrants. Well, what makes oh, you yeah. say that? Oh, I mean, there's a vast amount of evidence. I mean, there, are, there are ghettos in Europe, generational plate places where generationally you have people from Turkey, let's say, who are, have massive, you know, sky high unemployment, poverty, and it doesn't get any better generation after generation. 
they live in these compartmentalized air, you know, areas where they don't interact, don't assimilate, integrate into larger European society. You have the same thing in France. I mean, there are places, scary places, um, outside of Paris and elsewhere where you have immigrant immigrant groups that aren't assimilating where have they have to live with crime and poverty same thing in Italy and elsewhere uh, in the United States we don't really have that sort of thing um, because we're, we're we're kind of built for it now everyone's gonna say oh remember how mean we were to the Irish or the Italians yeah we're not perfect but in the end all those groups integrated assimilated went from poverty to the middle class and that happens with almost every so name any ethnic group in the united states and they will be more successful here than wherever they came from that includes the japanese that includes scandinavians that includes every single type of minority um and that's because we're just slightly idealized but i think we're we're, we're self-selected risk takers i think we get people here who want who take risks who, who are less concerned about uh, comforts and safety and more concerned about moving ahead and, and taking a risk in business or or whatever and uh and that's clear now illegal immigration here is a different story and not because of the reasons a lot of people are mad about illegal immigration i'm very pro-immigrant but i think illegal immigration the problem with having a huge crush of people from the same area coming in at the same time is that they do actually live in the shadows here and they are not going to integrate in society because they're not actually part of it in the right way because they've done it under you know, Ill Ill illegally. So in Europe, you have basically a similar situation. Sit I mean, I think the European experience is a warning not to allow that to happen. Can't have anarchy. I mean, you can be pro-immigrant, but you, you have to have a process for people to accept the ideals that they live under and become part of society. It's incredibly important to learn the language, to experience the things that Americans experience in general. And anyway, so, you know, I may, I, I think that that's important is when we're talking about Europe. Yeah, and, and shifting gears slightly, uh, America is supposedly, you, you cite a very interesting statistic in the book about how when people are asked to self-describe what negative attributes they would say about themselves, Americans, the number one one is selfish. Uh, there is this perception that Americans are selfish and individualistic and don't care about others, but yet Europeans are communal and egalitarian and benevolent you your research for this book really questions that and says that's not true why why well on the most you know on the most obvious level we give seven times as much charity per capita as a european it's not like europeans are poor people you know in the in the, in the context of the world itself it's the second richest place on earth and they're not very charitable but i think a lot of that has to do at least this is my thesis this is a lot of that has to do with the giant bureaucracy that elbows out churches and local community groups and and, and charities because people just are dependent on the state not just poor people but everyone right i mean you pay tons of taxes and then you're dependent on the state for the things that you get that that makes you complacent, docile, less inclined to participate in your local community. Um, so I think the American American life, because of necessity early on, you know, we had communities and they relied on themselves. And I think that became embedded in the ethos and the way we, we, we carry ourselves um, and also the risk taking. So I think that all of that, um, I've got your initial question was about uh, why we're more charitable. So I think that we just have a, we, we, we've sort of, evolved in a way that made us more charitable locally especially but even we give whenever there's a tragedy in the world we give more money than like the gdp of european countries so um i just think it's the way we are now they'll say well yeah we get we, but we pay a lot in taxes and and that's why we don't give as much charity and i say yeah that's the difference your system sucks compared to ours so that's why we give more charity well, uh, and that brings us to another point that you cover, which is the contrast in the economic systems, right? Because when we're talking about capitalism versus socialism, the reality is that most places are somewhere in between. They have mixed economies. But in the U.S., we have freer markets than in the European Union. We have less regulation, a smaller welfare state. Uh, and they point to that and they say that they provide people with health care and better outcomes, uh, but, you know, many people point to the American system and say, we've got a more thriving economy. Uh, we've got more innovation. What was the what were the conclusions that you reached when you compared and contrast the, the economic system in Europe versus in the U.S.? Um, well, I mean, there's no comparison in the in the amount. I mean, there's a comparison, but we are vastly outperforming them in generating wealth and new technologies. Can't even quantify that because they use so much of it. 
top, I think, 30 tech companies, only one is European, Spotify, basically leaning on American ingenuity there too, or, you know, technology there as well. Um, you know, in 2020, I think every Nobel Prize winner was American or had an American team member. You know, I can just rattle off stats like that forever. And big companies, forget it, we dominate as well. Um, so we're just a much more entrepreneurial, risk-taking society. And we, because of that, we generate more wealth. When you have a giant welfare state, you know, it, it, it saps, you know, it just becomes like a, just a, we, we sap that out of people because they're just so reliant on the state. And I just quickly want to say, I mean, you know, when I say that we're going to be more like Europe, it's not just about, again, quantifiable numbers. It's just that we would be a much more insipid, less dynamic place place right we would still be wealthy we, we have so much wealth and, and and our natural resources and how we're situated but it just wouldn't be the same what makes us american is that we are you know we don't look at failure as the end that almost every successful person has failure in their story and things like that that's not the it's not the european mindset for the most part it's not this, of course we're generalizing but in, in you know so in general <laughs> but um I don't know, you know, so like I'll give you a quick stat, Britain, I, I wrote about this, but Britain, if it was a United, if it was a state, we invaded them and made them a state, which we could do if we wanted, because we have the world's best military, we would, they would be the second poorest state per capita in, in the United States after Mississippi, almost wow. every European country would be in the bottom third, the only ones who outperform us or close are uh, like Luxembourg and Monaco and city states and I think maybe like Norway. 10 people. <laughs> What's that? They have like 10 people. Exactly. That's a major thing to think about is scaling those kinds of systems anyway to the United States, like, you know, Denmark or, or Sweden, but we can talk about Nordic states separately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you've mentioned a lot of quantifiable things that are really interesting, like the companies and the Nobel prizes, but they're also, and we are generalizing here. So I don't want to like stigmatize all Europeans or all the countries, but I know like I spent time in France when I was a teenager and like, I think the month of August, most places just shut down for the whole month and like businesses aren't working and workers aren't working. That's their vacation month. Like <laughs> there is, there does seem to be, if you look at mentalities towards work and work ethic and the cultural ethos surrounding work and vacation time and these other things, just a big gap between the U S and Europe. Did you find that? Not everywhere, but yeah, in general. I mean, let's be honest, the French, the Italians, and listen, it's a lifestyle choice and that's what they want to do and that's fine. But, you know, the Germans and Scandinavians have different work ethics than the Greeks or the Portuguese, or, you know, so there, there are different, uh, you know, there are different levels of work ethic, but like the French are terrible with that. Yeah, I mean, in the, in the, in the 70s or whatever, they would just strike every Friday and take the day off, you know, things like that. You know, in European countries, that was happens quite often. Unions, in a way, are quite p powerful and things like that. But I mean, you know, Germans have a very high level work ethic and Scandinavians, but, um, but yeah, I mean, in general though, absolutely. Americans have a high work ethic, but it's like, there's always this article be in the Atlantic or the New York times or something where they're like Europeans only, you know, they got 800 vacation days and, and Americans don't. And they always talk about work. Like it's something Americans don't want to do. I think Americans find meaning in work and they like to work. When you look at deeper in polls, Amer Americans like to, to go to their job. They, they, they like their jobs. They like their work. And it's very hard to, obviously to quantify happiness, um, but I think that Americans are as happy as anyone. Um, you know, they always show Scandinavian polls where, you know, they say they're happy, but Scandinavians always will say they're happy no matter what's happening. That's like part of their personality. So we don't really know what that means, but Americans do find meaning in work. So I'm not sure, you know, having a four day work week will make anyone any happier. Uh, Americans like to work. They like to build wealth. They like to take risk and build their business. I have some polls there about uh, they ask average European worker, maybe it was French, I forget, like, um, uh, would they rather be have more freedom to try new things and take risks? Or would they rather have a lifetime job or whatever? And like huge numbers of Europeans just want lifetime guarantee of work where Americans are not like that at all, like only 20% say that. So uh, I think that we built that culture because we don't have all these safety nets all the time, you know, and, uh, and if you, the more dependency you create, the more used to it people get, and then it becomes part of your culture. And that's just not something we, we should want. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned Scandinavians being happy because progressives will cite these like happiness indexes and happiness polls, uh, that are 
in my view at least pretty pseudoscientific that show like everyone in norway is so happy and sweden such a utopia but like a happiness index isn't a, a, an empirically rigorous thing right that's so subjective and vague and so subject to so many statistical biases uh but i mean they do typically american progressives aren't saying let's make the u.s more like spain or france they're saying let's make it more like sweden and norway and denmark and there's some misconceptions in how they promote those like those are actually market-based economies they're not socialism but why shouldn't we want to be more like Scandinavian countries? Well, you know, first of all, can we be more like them? You know, to scale that kind of bureaucracy to 350 million people is not just thinking about how big the government would be in this country. It's just un-American, I think. And it, 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 would, it would eat into all the other things I was just talking about. For me, the scariest thing about Europe and the scariest thing happening here is the massive bureaucracy that runs the country, where the CDC runs the country when there's a pandemic, where the State Department runs unelected. the country. Yeah, unelected. Uh, also sort of generational in the sense that they just hire people who think like them, this bureaucratic mindset, these technocrats who want to compel you to act a certain way. It's very dangerous. The bigger it gets, the more power they have. So, so it's not something that we should want. But also, as you, as you noted, you know, they, they, the Scandinavian countries are capitalistic. They have open trade. They are in some ways have better, more free trade than we do as far as trading with partners. And things like that. It's a capitalistic nation with a huge welfare state. It props up a welfare state. But the problem here is, of course, is that they have a wide tax base and pay for it. Where here you have Bernie Sanders who just wants a couple of rich people to pay for it. It's just not realistic where they just want to print money and pay for it. Uh, in Europe, uh, normal everyone pays like 60 or percent or more of their salary in taxes. It's, I don't even think that's counting the the of value added consumption taxes crazy um, and they're willing they're willing to do it because they have a lot high social trust they all like the government all the time we're a way too diverse a country with all kinds of ideological um you know uh, fights that we have and different worldviews, and we see the world through different prisms like it if you have one sort of people that basically all agree on everything and are very similar and aren't diverse it's a different story. And now that there's a lot of immigration, for instance, in Sweden, these it's not so simple anymore to do this sort of thing. So the question is, why would we want that? And could we have it even if we did? Well, I don't want the government to give me health care. I want to pick my health care. I don't even want the government to give me school, public schools. I want to pick schools for my kids. Right. Um, but I am quite, you know, maybe I'm out of, you know, I'm obviously a little bit more libertarian than most people, but I think that in general, that's an American mindset that we have competition, not just in schools, but in religion and in, in, in everything in, in the world. And we're used to that and we're happy with that, whereas Europeans tried, I think, to diminish that as part of their everyday lives. So that's really interesting. We do skip over that question. You know, should we be more like them? Is it even possible? Right. We kind of skip over that. But I am assuming and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that like the lo examining this entire continent, the European Union, Western Europe, there has to be something about their system that you like better or think they do better than the U.S. I is there anything? <laughs> um, not really. Uh, I would say they have... Our ideas, incidentally, are European ideas. So obviously, I love those ideas. I just think that they've manifested here in a much better way and evolved, whereas there, they've abandoned them. So I think when I say that that's a dying continent, I mean it. I just, no one was going to pick up a gun to defend the European Union. No one's excited by the European Union. No one is putting it. I mean, I, I guess some people, I wonder if the average European puts out a European Union flag. I just doubt it, but maybe they do. I, I didn't travel enough to know that. But um uh, the United States has an ideal. It's much more invigorating, I think, than anything that Europe offers these days. And the European Union tries to crush all the individual uh, eth ethnic, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but ethnicities have personalities. Hungarian are people with a thousand year history. They were more, they, they, they are a certain kind of people. They don't want to be like the French, et cetera. So these are, I think, going to be problematic. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think like France and Germany had excellent nuclear programs, energy. If you really want to lower carbon emissions, that's something to, we should be doing more. Um, now, Germany has abandoned it. I think France has, is coming back with more. But and now they're just bringing in gas from Russia and stuff like that. So I'm not even sure. 
Um, it's not an intellectually vigorous place. People agree on everything there. There's self-censorship there. So I don't, you know, and state censorship. So I don't want to do what they do with you know, oftentimes um, governments essentially can tell tech companies what to do, like a lot of uh, populists here want. Uh, I've never seen a government take over anything and say, oh, let's have more free discourse. They just do it to gain more power and shut down voices. So I'm just listing more things I hate about Europe. Um, Gun violence. I mean, we have a gun violence problem. It's a trade off for the freedoms that are important, at least to me and others, you know, that related to guns. But there's no doubt that we wouldn't have the sort of murder rates in big cities uh, if we didn't have the guns around. Um, and in Europe, they have fewer. Now, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of crime in Europe and different kind of crime. But the homicide rate, I think, is something to think about. They're not woke over there. I mean, they actually that's one thing. Um, you they, know, no, they are not. Right. The French push back. I mean, on, on that, they're much more, you know, wokeness doesn't really make any sense. It's constantly evolving and it's new and every, you know, things to be offended by in Europe. I think people are much more comfortable uh, with their backgrounds and things like that, because th most people are the same and, and the minority is rare. So they're not as offended by things. Probably. I don't know what the reasoning is, but um, obviously that they're not. So I'm trying to just think of things. Our sports are better. I mean, there's almost nothing that's better in Europe. Oh, that's where I was going to go with this. In okay, Europe, soccer. soccer is the main sport, and they have the best soccer leagues in the world. And the U.S., the MLS, is getting better, but still trash. So I would say their soccer system could be imported here and be magnificent because it is the best sport on the earth. So, so I would say that I'd rather shut down MLS and just shut down <laughs> soccer here because my whole life I've been hearing about how we're going to be good at soccer and it never really happens. And it's funny because I there's this old guy I know, he's been, I think he was born in 1930, two or something like that. And he was saying when he was a kid, they were saying the same thing, how soccer was just around the corner. Um, yeah, I hate soccer, but, you know, I'm not against, I, listen, I'm not, uh, I think you're, you know, Europeans love soccer. It's real. You know, you can see it. I mean, there's just love it so much. And that's just something wrong with that. I, I think that it's fine. That different cultures have different things that they admire and love and, and different traditions and things like that. That's what that's what makes life sort of interesting. It's like in America, we have so much diversity. And as I said, we all agree on certain ideas so we can live together. But isn't it wonderful to be able to just get any kind of food you want and meet all these people from all over the world and all of that? I, I love that kind of thing. And I don't think it should be suppressed at all. Um, except for, for soccer shouldn't be here. Yeah. Just ban it. Uh, <laughs> no, everyone's, so, allowed uh, one, everyone's allowed one authoritarian, you know, position and mine is banning soccer. Yeah. Mine is banning tanks, uh, but we won't get into that this time. Um, so maybe this will tie into your European, your Europe take, or maybe it will be just something different, but David, what is your most controversial food opinion? Now you already, you appeared on the podcast before, so you already must have given us one. I don't remember what it is. Do you? It was something that you laughed at and didn't agree with, but I can't remember what it was. I don't know. I, I forgot that you do this and I didn't have yeah. one ready for me. Do you, do you give one each episode or? I do. I ask every guest. I usually warn people. I should have warned you. Um, my most controversial one ever is that ketchup on steak is actually really good. And also how about, I, I like skim milk. How about, how about um, I'm a big, I'm actually quite a big fan of mayonnaise. You know who would hate that? Rand Paul. When he was on the show, he talked about how not only does he despise mayonnaise, but he believes there's a conspiracy and his wife is in on it of trying to slip mayonnaise into his food and then convince him that he likes it. <laughs> What's not to like about it, really? It's kind of it, it works with steak. It works on a burger. It works with like fish, you know, fried fish, things like that. I don't know. How about have, I'm sure this is a boring one that people must have have said but pumpkin spice is just garbage and gross is that agree everyone agrees yeah That's not i agree controversial. With that. yeah yeah but yeah. maybe some white girls are listening and are gonna burn their subscriptions <laughs> in protest all right david everybody go check out euro trash why america must reject the failed ideas of a dying continent the link to purchase it will be in the description david thanks so much for coming back on the show thanks for having me appreciate it Thank you.